Uh, first, let's just kind of touch on the landscape of vaccine hesitancy in the United States. Um, and I think we probably got enough leeway here that you can stop and ask me questions along the way, but we'll need to kind of, you know, march it along pretty, pretty briskly, um, as I said, so I can get you into your weekend. So uh, if you look at the U.S. share of populations that's fully vaccinated against COVID, we're, you know, getting around 55 plus percent uh, in the U.S. North Dakota's uh, just a little bit above 40 to 43 percent. We rank uh, about, whoops, we rank about 46 out of the 50 states. <clears throat> so we're kind of in the bottom uh, tier of uh, vaccine acceptance. <clears throat> and some of this is, uh, you know, historical. If you look at the U.S., um, the laws on vaccine um, mandates, if you will, school mandates, which is really the only place, and then healthcare, where we mandate vaccines, um, states have the power to decide how those mandates are, are relegated and managed. So the states individually decide what vaccines are required for schools, for example, and then they uh, also decide on what kinds of exemptions will be in place. So essentially every state has medical exemptions appropriately for uh, vaccine um, mandates in schools. <clears throat> but after that, it comes down to states that have religious exemptions or personal belief exemptions or both. And basically, if you have a personal belief exemption, that's more inclusive. So, um, and that's about, I can't remember, it's like uh, 18 or so states. I, I counted that up here recently. You can, and that's the cross hash mark. And North Dakota is one of those. And in fact, we are one of the easiest states to get a vaccine exemption for school. All the parent has to do is um, check a box on a form, sign their name at the bottom and hand it into the school secretary and the child is presto changeo exempt from vaccines or whatever vaccines the parent wants. Um, interestingly, you know, there are, uh, are a handful of states that don't allow any exemptions other than medical. California had been one of the most liberal states, <clears throat> uh, pretty similar to us. And then they had the big Disneyland measles outbreak and some sub subsequent measles problems. And they said they had a very activist pediatrician in the legislature um, who said enough of this and pushed through legislation to remove all non-medical exemptions. Very contentious, made it all the way up to their Supreme Court and was upheld. Uh, and so California, New York, Maine, West Virginia, <clears throat> Mississippi have only medical exemptions. So we have this history in North Dakota of a much more liberal uh, policy towards um, vaccination. If you look at trends in the U.S., this is before COVID. Uh, most of this is before COVID. 28% of Americans uh, do not agree that vaccines are safe. 50% <clears throat> of Americans, um, this is post-COVID, uh, early on, 50% early on when, when they were first being talked about said they would not get a COVID vaccine. One out of four Americans were hesitant about yearly influenza vaccines, some concern about effectiveness there, maybe appropriately. Um, and then non-medical exemptions, uh, uh, you know, are, are becoming prominent, especially with things like varicella vaccine, where they don't think it's maybe necessary and not safe. Some positive findings that we are going to play on uh, with all of this is that healthcare providers remain in almost every poll the most trusted source of vaccine information. I think COVID has take you know had us take a bit of a hit on that. Certainly, certainly a big hit with government, big hit in public health. But still, the the best chance for any sort of trust that remains is with the personal physician. Um, and there still is a relative positive relationship between overall trust in scientists or science and overall attitudes about vaccines. It's taken a hit, but it's still for the most part in positive territory. Towards the beginning of the pandemic, a Pew uh, survey, uh, this is actually a little ways into the pandemic, a Pew survey uh, of the uh, representative sample of the American public found that 53% of people said it was difficult to determine what was true. 39% thought it was made to be a bigger deal than it really was. 30% <clears throat> believed it was created in a lab. 20% believe it was no worse than seasonal flu. And about 15% watch some or all of the pandemic video. I don't know if you saw that or if anybody sent that to you. I was probably sent it about 20 times early on. It was, it's just full of crazy sauce. Um, and uh, a lot of people uh, watched that and it made all kinds of 
uh, gross mis misinformation claims. Oops, uh, say, I better make sure, did, Amelia, are you recording? Yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> so if you look at um, trends in vaccination status and intent in the United States, this is, uh, I think this is Kaiser Family Foundation data. The blue is uh, um, uh, vaccinated and that's, you know, been steadily uh, going up at least one or more doses of the vaccine or people self-reporting, uh, receiving at least one dose of the vaccine. And then kind of the uh, lighter blue, uh, you know, uh, darker blue here, definitely plan to get vaccinated. Lighter blue probably will get vaccinated, we're unsure. That's the sort of fence sitters, which did go down over time and accounted for, you know, uh, increasing acceptance of vaccine. But what you'll notice is that <clears throat> the probably or definitely will not get vaccinated has, has dropped a little, but has remained pretty robust. Um, and in North Dakota, it's really been robust and a lot more than the rest of the U.S. So the red here is the same thing with a 29 to 30 percent rate of our North Dakota population saying they probably or definitely will not get a vaccine and it ain't budging. So that's what we're here trying to see if we can budget. But um, this is a pretty dug in group um, in North Dakota. Um, similar data uh, taken from the Imperial uh, College of London shows roughly the same thing. The red here is unvaccinated and not willing to get vaccinated and fairly stable over time. Their <clears throat> um, rates are higher for the overall U.S., so they, I think they survey differently, but fairly consistent with what we're seeing here in North Dakota. When you <clears throat> look at the um, categories of who... Um, are predictors of not getting vaccinated. So of that group that are definitely or will not, uh, definitely will not get vaccinated, you can see that males uh, are higher than females, <clears throat> about 18% compared to 10%. Um, young, uh, more so than the old, uh, almost double. Um, and <clears throat> uh, not having a college education, uh, um, almost double uh, compared to those that uh, do have a college education. And Republicans over Democrats, that's got the biggest difference of all. That's a fourfold difference in um, uh, definitely are not willing to get a vaccine. <clears throat> and of course, we're a very red state here. So uh, we're, we're kind of, I think, seeing the fruits of that. Paul, do you have any information on Native American on that? Um, I don't directly, but I've seen um, different data on vaccine uptake, and it's as good or better in most of the tribes, not all, but most. And that's been true of a lot of our vaccines. Like, I mean, there's all these disparities, but when it comes to vaccination, maybe that's because you're traipsing around all these reservations, Terry, and doing your thing, but it's been, it's been uh, generally as good or better. Um, Kylie, you're on. Do you, I don't know if Kylie's listening in. Kylie, do you know on the Native American, on the um, tribes? Yeah, I'm listening. I don't have any data that I can think of off the top of my head that shows okay. one way or the other. Yeah, we will be collecting that kind of data. One of our other project managers, Carolyn Linster, who's on here now, that will be part of her work, uh, you know, going forward over the next couple of years. Yeah, and Paul, if I could just mention up at Turtle Mountain, I know that we are running around 50% right now on all of our internal data that we gather. But uh, actually, in the uh, 15 to 29-year-old age group, we're at 68% that have received one dose. Wow. It's incredible. Okay. And so that's why I was wondering if, this, if there's some national data. I have not seen a lot of national data on Native American communities, but I think you're absolutely correct that there is more acceptance of vaccine, I can't think, in, in just in my experience than, um, than other groups. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, one of the things might be trying to understand why that is, um, and if we can replicate it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that social media has really played a, a, a marked role in vaccine sentiment, where people get vaccine information. 65% um, of YouTube videos with the term vaccine safety as a keyword were anti-vaccine, so we tend to be losing the social media battle. Um, both pro and anti-vaccine parents identified anti-vaccine organizations as a reliable source. So when you do a Google search on vaccine safety, one of the sites that will come up is the National Vaccine, what's it called, NVI, National, what is it, Kylie, the uh, Barbalo Fisher's thing, National Vaccine Information Center, I think. 
Um, it's a big anti-vaccine website, looks really official, looks very slick. She's a media marketing person um, who knows how to make, you know, website and they're well-established, um, you know, anti-vaccine uh, propaganda. Um, anti-vaccine messaging is about four times more likely to be retweeted than neutral tweets. <clears throat> And there's this sort of illusion of debate. Uh, users rarely move across to areas with differing op opinions. And if you haven't watched the, the Social Dilemma on Netflix, watch, I highly recommend it. It's a documentary on how our social media really works. And it's really designed to amplify echo chambers. It's, uh, it's meant to help funnel us down into uh, holes that don't challenge our own worldview. Um, and that's because you get more clicks with it and you get more in the monetizing uh, uh, works that way. So one of the things that I, I do uh, think might be of interest to you that you might not dive into as much uh, um, given your various jobs is some of the evidence quality um, and cognitive biases that are at play and, and having us understand these I think can help open the door a little bit to trying to understand some approaches uh, to this. So, first of all, I think recognizing that it's uh, there's, there's well-established behavioral psychology research that suggests that <clears throat> a whole lot of the way we uh, approach decisions and thinking is, is really based on rapid uh, heuristic assessments. Heuristics are sort of shortcuts or rule of thumb kind of uh, uh, ways of approaching things rather than what we believe we do. Uh, you know, reasoning, deep cognitive thinking, you know, very thoughtful study of stuff. This was um, described, a book I highly recommend is Daniel Kahneman's um, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And he was a um, Harvard uh, psychologist who had a huge body of work kind of demonstrating um, how people make many, many of their decisions at almost a subconscious level using a variety of different heuristics and, and not really doing the hard work of deep cognitive thinking because it's hard work. And so most of us don't do that. Um, and <clears throat> there's a number of different cognitive biases that are at play with a lot of thinking that I think is very pertinent to um, vaccine decision-making. First is one of them called the do no harm or omission bias. This is the, this is a, a a uh, well-known cognitive bias that we tend to um, uh, not like the idea of a, a potentially bad outcome from something that I deliberately decided to do. So if I'm trying to decide between problems with the vaccine versus problems with the virus, the virus is fate. I, I'm leaving it up to fate to whether it's going to affect me or not. But a vaccine I'm making an appointment at Thrifty White. I'm driving my car down there. I'm going up to the pharmacist. I agree to the vaccine information statement. I watch them draw up the you know, vial into the, into the syringe and I watch them put the needle in my arm. And then if something bad happens, that really feels like you own it, like it's on you. <clears throat> Whereas uh, you know, a problem from the virus feels much more like fate. And, and we cognitively lean towards um, uh, omission, you know, problems of omission rather than problems of commission. Um, but we have to get past that. We have to help people get past that because a decision to take the virus versus the vaccine is a decision either way. And it's really a math problem. It's not a gut problem. It's not a cognitive bias problem. It's math. Um, there's what's called the ambiguity bias, which is that we tend to be more comfortable with known than unknown risks. An example of this might be I know lots of people uh, that have uh, children with autism. Um, I don't know anybody that's had a kid with measles. Um, I, I, autism is way more prominent in my mind and way more of a known risk than is measles or diphtheria. I mean, I don't even know what diphtheria is, right? <clears throat> I bet even Dr. Dwelly hasn't seen a case of diphtheria. Maybe, maybe he has, I don't know. You have, okay, I should have known. Um, and then uh, we, there's something called the availability bias, where we tend to conflate things that we remember more easily. So a bad outcome you know, from a vaccine um, that you heard about from a friend or a neighbor or you saw written up somewhere um, often will play prominently in our mind because we can recall it much more easily. Um, and then there's something called a compression bias, where we tend to overestimate rare risks and underestimate common risks. 
I'm more afraid of getting eaten by a shark when I swim in the ocean than I am of influenza. Um, and, but you're far, far, far more likely to have a bad outcome from influenza than um, a shark uh, swimming in the ocean. Um, the other problem, uh, another book that I recommend is this Enumeracy, if, if you like this sort of thing, by John Allen Paulos. He's a statistician and he, he kind of writes this for the common person. He, and he really gets it like really just how substantially illiterate we are mathematically in, in, in the U.S. in the general population. And it isn't a lot better even in the educated population. Um, we tend to make a lot of different um, fundamental biased assumptions that are off oftentimes by large magnitudes. Some examples that have been given with this, uh, uh, the top one was, um, uh, uh, I think that was uh, an outcome referred to in an Annals of Internal Medicine article where they were asking women to estimate their risk of breast cancer um, and do some sort of basic kind of uh, inferences from some data they were given. And, and, and they found like the vast majority of women were just way off on this, just really couldn't, couldn't conceive of what they were being told with probability risk. And they noted in there from other research that if you kind of take the general pop um, population and you ask them questions like, if I toss a coin a thousand times, how many times will it typically come up heads? 46% didn't get a correct answer. Um, if you ask them to convert 1% to a proportion of 1,000, 46% didn't get the right answer. And if you ask them to flip that and convert one out of 1,000. So we're coming at people with percentages and proportions or whatever, and it, it, it actually doesn't, doesn't make a proper mental image in a lot of people's minds. And if we think we're a lot smarter, uh, you know, my daughter isn't real happy with this. She's a fourth year OB resident. So they picked on OB residents in this study <clears throat> and they surveyed almost 5,000 OB guy residents and two thirds of them, like most of us do said, you know, I'm better than most at whatever I'm being asked about. They said their statistical literacy was good to high um, only, but only 42% could correctly define what a P value was something that we rely on all the time in all the research we, we read. And only 26% could answer a positive predictive value question, actually much more, clinically appropriate uh, application of a statistical concept that really matters a lot in our, um, our clinical decision-making, even, even somewhat more than sensitivity and specificity. And 26% could only answer that correctly. And about 12% got both questions right. So this is a common uh, problem. <clears throat> and the way we communicate information to people um, often does not take a good account of this. I'll show you an example where, where it's, it was done better here recently um, uh, with Sanford, um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. And then other issues um, are, that are common pitfalls in re reasoning are you know, what we call confirmation bias. Most of us are familiar with that. We tend to look for and grab on to things that confirm our already preconceived notions. And similar to this is something called motivated reasoning, where I'm actually motivated to go out and search for um, things that uh, confirm my uh, reasoning and bias. And we all do this. Like I see it in myself. If I see a paper that challenges vaccine efficacy, I'm looking right away to see what methodologic flaws it had and I want to shred it. And if there's something that says it was great, I'm like, yeah, that's a good paper. Um, the, the, this, is, this is confirmation bias that you know, occurs even in you know, scientists and doctors and people who are, who are educated in this sort of thing. So, you know, a couple of the uh, jokes uh, on this that I thought were humorous, you know, Warren Buffett has the line that what human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that their prior conclusions remain intact. Or here, the long line being, be, be, you know, for the comforting lies as opposed to the empty line be, for unpleasant truths. <clears throat> um, and the guy sitting at the computer here, you're right, and everyone else is an idiot. Yeah, I trust this website. You know, um, uh, and I've seen this with some of my family, like they'll, they'll go to, you know, let's say, well, Paul, you wear a white coat. This other person wears a white coat, you know, you're a doctor, that person's a doctor. Um, you know, who, I mean, who am I going to believe? I kind of like what this guy's saying rather than what you're telling me. Um, and uh, um, they'll find, you know, websites and so on that affirm their own bias. Third book I'll recommend, and I'll probably stop recommending books, is Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, uh, Why Good People Are Divided Over Religion and Politics. 
He's a, uh, again, another behavioral psychologist trained at Yale. Um, he's in Virginia now, I think. And uh, he writes a lot on um, how we've evolved sort of our moral intuitions. But a couple of things that I thought were really helpful from uh, his, his book and his body of research is he gives this analogy of what's called the rider and the elephant that um, most of us, you know, when we think about a rider and an elephant, see this big animal, you know, moving along and, and you think of the rider being the conscious mind, the rational mind um, steering the elephant. But he said, it's really not the case. And, and he gives a, a big body of research to show this, that most things we do are driven by our sort of emotions, our passions, our gut feelings. And we have a rider up there that's justifying which way the elephant's going and uses the reason and the mouthpiece to like say, this is really where I wanted to go and why. Um, uh, but it's, it's the elephant kind of driving the, uh, driving the ship, if you will. And um, <clears throat> um, another, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to, I think I have another aspect from him too, but he, he's got a number of, I think, insights that are helpful in trying to understand uh, behavioral psychology. I, I'll mention the one other one here. Another one that he shows that is that in this motivated reasoning is that most people, when they kind of look for this confirmation bias or motivated reasoning, just want something out there that will affirm their uh, preconceived notions. Can I find, and the way he says it is, can I find something out there that confirms my, my preconceived bias? Almost always, especially with a quick Google search, I can almost always find something you know, something that will confirm my, my preconceived notion. Um, do I find enough information out there that I must change my belief? Almost never. The bar is way higher for that. Like, must I change it? There, there's not enough out there. I got this one guy over here, this one gal over here who affirms what I want, and they sound like a plausible expert to me. Um, uh, Another, uh, some of the research that's talked about in that book and is by another guy, uh, this guy from Harvard as well, a guy named Daniel Kahan, different than Kahneman that I just talked about. Uh, real fun TED, TED Talk video that this guy does, if you want to have your mind bent a little bit, is a um, uh, provocative title uh, is, Are Smart People Ruining Our Democracy? And um, he, he gets into these cognitive biases and, and he's done some really elegant experiments. And one of these was where he took a, uh, I think it was a group of students or a group of subjects and he pre-polls them to kind of find where they are on sort of their political ideological spectrum, liberal, moderate, conservative. And then um, he tells them, I want you to look at the resume of this expert, professor in meteorology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, PhD from Harvard, a member of the American Meteorological Society and the National Academy of Sciences. And then I want you to tell me if you think this person looks like a credible expert. And to the one group, they say, he supports that human activity is changing our climate. And lo and behold, the conservatives say, I don't think he's a very good expert. I don't think his credentials are all that great. And the liberals will tend to say, I think this guy's awesome. He really looks like a great, credible uh, expert. And then when they flip it and say that this person does not believe human activity is changing climate, the exact opposite happens. The conservatives say, yeah, this is guy's got a really good resume. I think he's a good expert. And the liberals say, no, I don't think this person's credible. The exact same resume, the exact same objective uh, uh, criteria, completely flip, the audience completely flips based on what they hear uh, his beliefs are and whether, or his, his science is, and whether it aligns with their preconceived beliefs. One that I like even more, and I kind of try and show to my class, <clears throat> this was one where they show a video of protesters outside a building. And the, the group is asked to judge whether these protesters are guilty, they're, they're told to put themselves in the position of being a juror. And you are asked to judge whether these protesters were intimidating and obstructing the building and, and should they be charged with a misdemeanor crime. Um, <clears throat> on the one hand, they are told that the protesters are outside an abortion facility uh, protesting against abortion. And lo and behold, when you ask the liberals of the group whether they are obstructionist and <clears throat> um, intimidating, they, for the most part, say yes. Uh, they would charge them with this misdemeanor offense. Uh, 
And the conservatives say, no, I think they're reasonable. This is reasonable First Amendment protest. When they flip the narrative and say they are protesters outside a military recruitment facility during the don't ask, don't tell era, uh, which prohibited gays in the military, and they were protesting this policy, the liberals say, uh, no, I think they're reasonable protesters, uh, you know, just doing their First Amendment rights. And the conservatives say, no, I think they're intimidating and obstructionist. The exact same video, only things that's changed is the narrative, completely different interpretations that flip based on their preconceived notions. Um, this is the TED talk that I was mentioning, uh, Daniel Kahana. It's, he, he gives some more of this research. And, and one of the troubling things about it is, is that the smarter and more educated people do this more. They're better at it in their mind of flipping in, in, and, and um, being less objective. You'd think it'd be the opposite. It's not. The only group that seemed immune to that um, preconceived sway were people that self-identified as being really interested in reading science for their own pleasure. That group seemed to um, sort of be the most immune to their uh, preconceived leanings, swaying how they look at these types of studies. Uh, interesting. All right. So one of the things I would say is uh, you're training doctors, right? You're, you're training doctors and you're training doctors uh, on how to maybe do a better job in kind of confronting this with their patients. And so one of the first things we need to do is get our own house in order, recognize we do this too. We have a number of doctors in North Dakota that are prone to this mis misinformation. We're getting reports of a number of the doctors out there that are prescribing ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine that are, uh, you know, um, uh, not recommending vaccines in certain scenarios or altogether. Um, and, and we have doctors who are on a spectrum of this. For the most part, you know, I think the doctors are on board, but we are, we are sending you to some clinics where that's not the case, and we know it, we know about it. So we have to kind of help each other, you know, work through our own cognitive biases, recognize these, and kind of get our own house in order. Um, these are some smart people and, and some not so smart people that have been, um, I shouldn't disparage any of them, but I mean, these are all uh, doctors who um, have made big names for themselves out in, uh, um, you know, on CNN and in, in front of uh, congressional committees. And I just got sent this woman's video for, I think, about the 15th time in the last six months. I got sent it again yesterday. Um, <clears throat> and um, and, and it's interesting. So on the right here are some people that are, I think, really abusing their, their position. So um, Dr. Lee Merritt is a orthopedic surgeon who's been out saying how the vaccine's killing people and the vaccine's dangerous. And she gets, she doesn't even really understand the difference between RNA and DNA. And this, I mean, if you listen to this video, you're like, oh, it's a big face plant, you know, of your palm here. And, um, but but there's a lot of people that just love her because she's saying what they want to hear. Um, America's frontline doctors, you may have kind of seen them. They were on the Supreme Court steps. Uh, Dr. Simone Gold has made a big name for herself. In this group of people are a pain specialist, an eye doctor, uh, a couple family physicians, an urgent care doctor, um, uh, an orthopedic surgeon, um, no infectious disease, no virology, no epidemiology. I mean, there's and, and in fact, the American Medical Association, I think I have a slide on this, says this is really an ethics violation to be going outside your specialty and speaking as an expert outside your specialty. These other people are closer to it. Um, Dr. Paul Merrick is a uh, intensivist who's just, just really been pounding the ivermectin thing. Previously, the hydroxychloroquine, you know, kind of poo-pooing the vaccine, really promoting ivermectin. And he's an academic at, uh, I think, the University of Virginia. Um, what's this guy's name again? Peter McCullough, I think, um, uh, uh, was an academic cardiologist. Uh, big, he has an MPH, um, published a lot in the area of acute kidney injury. That was his area of research, but he's made himself a self-fashioned, uh, you know, a COVID expert and pushing hard on the hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin and, and really talking smack about the vaccines. This guy was a, a prominent Yale, um, uh, I can't remember if he's an MD or just a PhD, but he's a epidemiologist, cancer epidemiologist, 
who um, did publish and did have some of his discussions in medical journals, um, really pushing hydroxychloroquine hard. Um, that was when we just had observational data, which was showing some of the studies showed it helped, some of the studies showed it didn't. And he just became really resistant to as one after another, after another randomized controlled trial showed no benefit. I think we're up to 13 randomized controlled trials now showing no benefit. Um, just couldn't let it go. So, I mean, th this happens even in our own ranks. Um, I, I was reminded of this, you know, the Monty Python, uh, you know, uh, Holy Grail, like, you know, as the Black Knight's getting hacked to pieces, it kind of reminded me of the hydroxychloroquine thing, you know, now over 13 randomized controlled trials and a meta-analysis showing no benefit to hydroxychloroquine, will you yield? Tis but a flesh wound, you know, fight me, you know, it's, a, it's, it, it's just stunning. Um, it's stunning. Um, I'm also reminded Mark Twain's line, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <clears throat> um, kind of wisdom from uh, the literary circles. So one of the things I've been trying to, I've been trialing this, uh, um, when, I've, when I've talked to people about, okay, you know, you say you don't know who to trust. You don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. There's all these different people saying things. We ought to be kind of, I think, helping people aspire to a, a rising hierarchy of expertise. Um, so, you know, do they have education or training more than general population? Okay, maybe I'll have a conversation over a beer on my patio with, and I'll listen more to the biology teacher at the high school than my hairdresser. Uh, I don't have a hairdresser anymore. Okay, then my, you know, what, what, whatever, my grocer. Um, but that's not a lot of expertise. Um, really, do they have specialized education or training on the topic? That's what we, we want to know. Do, do they have specialized education or training in virology, epidemiology, infectious disease? Now, all doctors kind of fit that bill, um, but, but not all doctors fit bill with specialized training in that. Um, are they? And then another couple steps beyond that is, are they recognized by their peers as an expert on the topic? So, you know, I mean, um, Dr. Dwelly and I might be, uh, you know, smart infectious disease doctors, but we're not nationally recognized. Well, maybe Terry is because he was a state health officer for the longest running time, but we were not the sort of go-to CNN, you know, infectious disease expert uh, out there. And um, we published a few things here and there, but there are probably people that uh, are, are even more recognized in, in that area. Then I would say, do they reflect the consensus of the scientific community? And if they don't, because new ideas come along that are, are groundbreaking and, and are against the convention. And that may be, that may be the right thing. Um, uh, so <clears throat> do they reflect that scientific community? And, and if not, okay, but do they acknowledge that they're a contrarian view and can they articulate a cogent evidence-based medicine argument on why they differ? Um, it's not just enough to go, I've uncovered the truth that nobody else sees. I mean, they have to really give a cogent argument for it and recognize that they're kind of bucking the grain. Um, and then importantly, are they disclosing any conflicts of interest? And, and, and where are they putting out their stuff? Is it mainly on political forums? Like, like I was sent this Dr. Lee Merritt's video again off a very, very political forum. Yeah, that's where it, that was, that's where it was posted. It's not being posted in in scientific communities or medical journals or scientific debate. Um, you know, and when you kind of think about some of the players out there in this, um, you can kind of walk through some of those. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. doesn't make any of them, right? <clears throat> America's frontline doctors, well, they got some education or training, but none of the rest of the stuff. I don't know about conflicts of interest. Some of them I think are making some pretty good money on speaking tours now. Um, the Bakersfield urgent care doctors, if you follow those guys uh, at the beginning, I mean, these, they were just, they probably are good in urgent care doctors. They were really bad epidemiologists. They really didn't know how to do some basic math stuff. Um, they fit the first box, not the rest. Plandemics video, that woman actually was a bona fide scientist back in the day. She got fired um, because of some ethics violations, um, no longer works as a scientist anywhere. And, um, you know, is not recognized by her peers, not reflecting the consensus. Um, and she is profiting from the, these videos. Dr. Harvey Risch, the Yale epidemiologist, he fits the bill, cancer epidemiology rather than infectious disease epidemiology. So I gave him a black check mark, but kind of a check mark, um, not reflecting the consensus. Um, <clears throat> I don't think he has any conflicts of interest. So might listen to him a little bit more than the rest. I mean, I, I, I read his papers. 
Francis Collins, I chose him instead of Dr. Fauci because for whatever reason, Dr. Fauci is a lightning rod now, so I don't say him anymore. But, um, you know, Dr. Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, fits all the bills here, right? All right, so that idea of, from Jonathan Haidt, can I support my belief? Yeah, I found these Americans frontline doctors, um, they support what I want to believe. You know, must I change my belief? Uh, you know, the bar's pretty high there. Doesn't matter if it's the ACP saying it, the ACOG, the IDSA, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, re reflecting consensus of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of doctors in those various specialties. N not quite cutting it. I got America's frontline doctors over here. That's motivated reasoning. That's, that's the can I versus must I, a lot harder. <clears throat> And I just bring this up, I mentioned it, uh, this is the American Medical Association Code of Ethics, just highlighting that when physicians speak to the public, they really should keep it within being commensurate with their medical expertise, confine their medical advice to the areas of expertise, um, and should clearly distinguish the limits of their medical knowledge where appropriate and fully disclose any conflicts of interest. I think a number of these people are at least if you buy into the AMA's code of ethics on this are violating the, that code of ethics. And now um, there was a call from uh, um, <clears throat> uh, the, um, uh, it's the overseeing uh, group that oversees medical boards of all the states. It's like the society that oversees all of them. They are calling for states state medical boards to more strictly discipline these physicians that are publicly spreading misinformation or in their practice. Uh, and there, there's now about three or four examples of doctors that have lost their licenses over this. All right. Next is, um, uh, you know, not, not all evidence is created equal. Uh, what's the hierarchy of evidence? <clears throat> um, so, uh, everybody's heard the line, you know, association does not equal causality. But I, I have found that, you know, a lot of physicians and, and a lot of medical students and residents um, certainly know that like randomized controlled trials are great um, and that, you know, a case is not really enough, but they get real fuzzy on everything in between. Um, and so we, we need to get better at our own knowledge on strength of evidence. So um, first is, I think, kind of refresh your memory if you, if you haven't looked at this in a long time or if you haven't ever looked at this, it's the Bradford Hill Criteria for Causality. Um, so the, these were some people that uh, quite a while back helped try to articulate and quantify um, how we can make better and better causal inferences. Does, it, does the association have temporality? Does the cause precede the effect? Is it plausible? Is the association consistent with existing knowledge? Is it consistent? Does it have similar results um, be, between several studies? Is, it, is there strength? Is, how strong is the association between the cause and the effect? Is there a dose response? Um, it, as you increase the exposure, do you increase the effect? Are there alternative explanations <laughs> that might e also equally account for the relationship? And what's the study design that was being looked at? Is the evidence based on a robust study design? And is it coherent? Is the association compatible with existing theory and knowledge? Um, these should all be kind of looked at when, when different causal associations are being proposed. And then just a, a review of some of the basic study designs. <clears throat> um, are We have you know, what we call descriptive studies, analytic studies, and experimental studies. Descriptive studies, describe, they examine patterns of disease. Um, they do not have control groups. So you can't make, this is the lowest of sort of making causal inferences. Analytic studies are studies typically of suspected causes of diseases, things where you can't assign the exposure. I'm not going to assign one group of people to smoke so I can compare them to another group of people that don't smoke and then see how they do with uh, you know, lung cancer or COPD. So we tend to not be able to assign exposures uh, when it comes to uh, causes of disease, but we do assign exposures when it comes to treatment modalities. So these are experimental studies. Um, the descriptive ones try and look at who, what, when, and where. Um, analytic is the why and how, and experimental assign exposure. And these are not equal, right? These are not uh, equal. So um, 
in the hierarchy of epidemiologic study design, there's kind of a break point here um, where you go from descriptive to analytic epidemiology. And, um, you know, I think we all have a pretty good sense that a case might be interesting, but it is not certainly anywhere near enough to say uh, this is causal. Case series, only slightly better. Um, what people may not be as familiar with are ecologic studies, and there's a lot of these published, uh, and I'll show these in a second. Um, and then you get into the things that can get closer to assigning causality, and the evidence quality goes up. Um, and <clears throat> these are case control studies, retrospective cohort studies, prospective cohort studies, randomized controlled trials, and then meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials. So to try and just, I think most people have a decent idea of this, but just to lay it out further, um, when you're looking at epidemiologic study design, you're trying to look at a study that's making some claim. Um, you at first can ask, did the investigator sign the exposure, which is usually going to be with either a diagnostic modality or treatment modality. And was it randomized? Um, and so those are our randomized controlled trials or sometimes non-randomized controlled trials. Or if the investigator doesn't assign the exposure, it's then an observational study. And so we have a comparison group where, we're, <clears throat> um, where we, we wanna know, is there a comparison group? Is there a control? Yes, that's an analytical study. No, it's a descriptive study, a case, a case series or an ecological study. These analytical studies get us closer to causality, get us closer to um, a higher order of truth. And, and the difference between a case control and a cohort, I'm gonna skip cross-sectional, but a difference between a case control and a cohort, the two of the better analytical studies is a case control, um, you go from outcome and look backwards to exposure. So I look at um, uh, outcome, uh, Severe COVID, exposure, vaccinated, not vaccinated. <clears throat> Conversely, if it's a cohort study, you're starting with exposure and moving to outcome. Cohort, uh, I'm going to follow this vaccinated group compared to a matched unvaccinated group and see how they do with outcomes over time. That's a cohort study. Ecological studies like this one, um, are fraught with problems. They ask questions, they don't answer questions. Here's an ecologic study showing vaccine mercury burden by vaccines in the United States in the 80s and 90s going up. You know, we added mercury to some vaccines in children, uh, children's vaccines over time. And lo and behold, in this California um, cohort uh, that follows autism, noted uh, rising autism rates over that same period of time. This was a fairly tight correlation. Um, <clears throat> this is an ecologic study. This is where you're looking at trends in populations. You're not actually looking at individual subjects and their exposure. You're looking at trends. So um, you have to really be cautious about these and not put a lot of weight. Um, here's an ecologic study I did on the fly. I just looked up a couple databases and I looked at autism rates in the United States and US subscribers to cell phone service. <clears throat> that has a correlation coefficient of 0.993. That's a very tight correlation. Do we think US cell phone subscriptions are causing autism? I mean, that's to me maybe more plausible than vaccines, but uh, this isn't an, an ecologic study. Here's another one that somebody else did. Um, uh, sales of organic foods uh, and uh, rates of autism in the United States. Another really tight correlation here. Um, to kind of put an illustrative point on this. There's a, a fun guy named Tyler Vegan. He's a statistician. He has a website where he does all these spurious associations and he's got all kinds of them. Uh, this is one of them. Number of people who drowned by following, falling into a pool actually correlates fa fairly well with how many films Nicolas Cage appeared in that year. So it's statistically significant, uh, modestly uh, good uh, correlation coefficient. You know, do we think Nic Nicolas Cage is inducing people to fall into pools? Um, maybe, but um, so we have to be very careful of these uh, correlational uh, studies. So what do these case, case series and ecologic studies lack? They lack a control group. Um, and so we don't give them as much credence. It doesn't mean they're worthless. It just means they are posing a question rather than answering a question. 